Hi, this is David Wilner. I'm Renee Levy Sullivan. This is another Landmines podcast. Today we have a very interesting erudite and I would say at the top of his game scholar with us today in our virtual studio. Renee, who are we talking with? Rabbi Dr. Yeshua Berman is a professor of Tanakh at uh, Bar Ilan University and is the author of a brand new book, Animamin, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and the 13 Principles of Faith, and is published widely, lectured widely, and we can't wait. Welcome, Rabbi Dr. Yeshua Berman. Okay, David Barnea, thank you so much for this, uh, for this honor. So there are very few people in this arena. How did you get into this arena? What triggered it at age three, 30? How did you get into this? Uh, I assume by the arena you mean academic biblical studies. Yes. Right. Okay. No, so it wasn't at age three. I certainly wasn't born into it. Uh, I would say that um, um, I, spent, I spent about eight years studying in Yeshivat Haretzion, uh, in Gush Etzion. And uh, during that time, it's a place where they obviously, like all yeshivas, there's a, a high level of study of Talmud. But also that yeshiva is known for its high level of study of, of, of Tanakh as well. And I kind of caught the, uh, the Tanakh bug and um, decided that's what I wanted to do with my life. And I started teaching. Um, I was teaching mostly in um, gap year programs for Orthodox Jews who come for the year to Israel. And I decided that I wanted to take things a little bit further, develop my, my skills, uh, my toolbox for analyzing the Tanakh. And that meant uh, getting a doctorate. And I did that at Bar Ilan University. Um, the friends out there might be familiar with the type of literary approach um, uh, pioneered, championed by the likes of people like Menachem Liebtag, uh, Rabbi David Silver in America for the Jewish members of our audience. Uh, and that's kind of what I was doing at the beginning. The, the, my most recent work, the last 10 years, has kind of been um, how do I, as a person of faith, as an Orthodox Jew, as an Orthodox rabbi, uh, grapple with the challenges of biblical criticism. This is really something that I didn't deal with for a very, very long time. Uh, it's only in the last 10 years. And uh, I really got into this because I saw that I think for, for people of faith everywhere, these questions, which used to be really the kinds of questions that were just for the ivory tower. I mean, I remember when I was in yeshiva in the 1980s, and there were some guys in yeshiva who were thinking about source criticism, you know, J, P, E, and D. And I was like, how did they even, like, they wanted to read about that. How would they do that? They'd have to get on a bus and go for an hour into Jerusalem and then another bus into a big library and find their way around and find the books and take the books out. I mean, obviously the world that we live in now is different. You don't have to go to the library. The, the internet comes flooding into your face every time you open it up. And so these questions became very live questions for simple people of faith in the pews. And the, as the questions got greater, I realized, you know, those of us that are in the academy, but still very much feel themselves as members of the faith in, in, in every way, uh, it's up to us to try to, to try to, you know, think about these questions uh, in a rigorous, but uh, in a way that's also true to our traditions. And that's what got me started. And, the book that, uh, that you mentioned just now, Barnea, is uh, about 10 years in the making. I'm just holding it up because this uh, isn't recorded so you can see it. And uh, I, I bought it because I spent the day with Rabbi Dr. Rafael Zaram in the London School of Jewish mm -hmm. Studies. Mm -hmm. And he friend. spoke highly of it and said they interviewed yeah. you. Yeah. So I walked in for a different book to Pomerantz Bookseller with a mask not touching the door and not touching any of the books. And I saw this, I have to get it. I only saw the price after I left the store, but I didn't regret it, even though it's far beyond my normal budget for a book. I feel yeah. well worth it. And I consider it, um, I forgot the name of it. I think it's called an icebreaker. It's the big boat that goes and breaks up the ice so that other boats uh, can go. And whatever one's opinion about and there's two parts to the book, and there's different aspects which are being dealt with, individual stories, uh, principles of Jewish faith, uh, this is an icebreaker for sure. And uh, it can be recommended to those who are grappling, and then, you know, then they can fight it out. So I, I want to express my uh, personal uh, appreciation. I want to pull you back again just before we get into the heat of it. You caught the Nach bug. 
So uh, is Professor Israel Finkelstein of Tel Aviv described that when, I know Zev Herzog was in the room, I think it was Nadav Neman teaching, and weave together the story of King Hezekiah and Sennacherib and the artifacts and the geography and the archaeology, that's when he got the bug that that's what I want to do. I want to be able to enter that world, right? That was his moment. And um, another nice one is not Magin Broshi. Was it Magin Broshi? Magin Broshi. Magin Broshi said, I didn't want to do this, but in order to get our degree, we had to spend time working in archaeology. And I was in the cave with Pesach Bardan. I pulled this up, and it was a scroll of a tefillin. And I read the Shema Yisrael, and I was reading something for 2,000 years ago, and I was gone. <laughs> That's what wow. I was doing, you wow. know, right? And uh, Guy Stiebel was a prehistorian, but when he found, I think it was in Gamla, the complete uh, armor of a Roman who had been crushed by one of the rooftops in the battle, he's now from the great experts in Roman military, right? That's his bug. Is there a moment, is there a particular teacher that time after time, can you define that? And the reason why I'm asking is because the Nach bug is rare and we'd like more people to become infected with it. We'd like a pandemic of Nach bug. So we look for that example. You know, I would say that it's just the general uh, environment in the Gush, in the Shivat Haaretzion and kind of you, once you pick up the tools, then applying them myself, myself, and just suddenly discovering lots of beautiful things. That's, well, that's what uh, I would say. I assume you're probably uh, a day school graduate, like Barney and I are, of the American uh, Jewish educational system. Well, and... I, I, yes, but I, I need to give a caveat to that. Um, okay. I, I don't fit into the, the regular boxes neatly. Fair enough. Is, what, uh, just and it's important yeah, yeah. because it, it really contributes to the motivation to write this book and my perspective on life and on orthodoxy generally. Uh, my parents were not from uh, a traditional background, but uh, I, when it was time to send me to, day, to, to, to elementary school, it was in the euphoria of the Six Day War, and so they very much wanted me to get a day school education. So although they themselves were not orthodox, so they, so they sent me to day school and then uh, I had great teachers and I, I ran with it. I, I became observant around the time of my bar mitzvah. And this, this, this biographical note is important because, because, you know, I think that for a lot of religious people, many of these questions from biblical criticism don't really matter very much. And I say this in a positive way about them because their, their, their affinity for the tradition and their commitment to it is literally from their mother's milk. And so therefore, okay, so maybe there's questions they don't have answers for, but they're, they're, they're committed to it because it's just such an imminent part of who they are and who they always were. But for me, because I came to it, because I always had to think about, is this what I want? What do I want? What are the alternatives? Seeing things from inside, seeing things from outside. And this is a kind of way of thinking and being that is really just who I am. That's my mother's milk. And so, you know, Asking these questions and not being able to duck from them is really just part of my DNA, I guess. That's so I appreciate that. My, co my, my comment is a little bit more basic even than that. I think Barney and I are both coming out of somewhat similar kinds of, of backgrounds, but my comment is really on the Jewish educational system, and there's a, there's a type of irony, and that is um, as we progress past the elementary school levels of Jewish education, for boys, if you're in that yeshiva day school world, there's less of an emphasis on knowing Tanakh right. than there is on studying Talmud, on studying the Gemara. Right. And as a result, um, many um, graduates of the Jewish educational system may be proficient and maybe, hopefully, are able to learn a black Gemara, are able to learn a page of Gemara, um, but may have completely forgotten everything that they learned in uh, the Nevi'im, in the Prophets. And their only connection is the fact that many of the different tractates source the verses, and that may be their only experiences of those particular books that they will ever encounter. Mm -hmm. And yeah. in contrast to that, and this is where the irony comes in, is that if you meet any educated Christian, uh, their knowledge of the Bible is extensive uh, yes. and often 
uh, verbatim. They can quote chapter and verse um, in astonishing ways at times, not with Rashi and, uh, you know, the Kliyakar, not with the various commentaries, but certainly in terms of their knowledge of the verse, it's very strong. And for the people of the book, which is kind of how we're known in the world, the fact that we have many knowledgeable Jews that lack basic knowledge in the Bible comes as a bit of a surprise. And I, I, I recall now one, one traumatic, traumatic incident I had on an airplane. I was sitting next to a, a knowledgeable Christian and he caught on to the fact that I'm a rabbi. He was like, oh, you're a rabbi? Oh, I'm just now studying Zechariah. Can I ask you about Zechariah 4? And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> You know, yeah. Yeah, we had, we had a cook in yeshiva. We were studying outside. I don't know, Barnea, if you were in the yeshiva at that time, right? And the cook came out. Her name was Mama Jean, uh, who was a, a, a large Italian woman. And she goes, you boys studying about Melchizedek? And we had no idea who she was talking about. The fact that she was referring to Melchizedek only occurred to us much later on, right? But she knew her Bible. Um, and so we, 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 we are now kind of on the threshold of a challenge that to some degree is unprecedented in the yeshiva world, and that is the yeshivas are having to contend with modern biblical criticism. Um, and so one of the common things that I hear um, from uh, graduates of yeshiva at Haaretzion and other yeshivas as well um, is that since we have no archaeological evidence for uh, Yitziat Mitzrayim, for the exodus from Egypt... I there, demur, I demur. But I understand why you demur. Um, but this is something that you address uh, head-on, um, as, our, as, our, as is happening in a number of different venues as well. Um, that's not really as much Bible criticism as it's understood in the university as it is challenges to faith. And so these things are kind of happening at the same time, right? Challenging of faith and mm -hmm. biblical criticism, right? How do I compartmentalize that? So may, maybe give us a sense of what it is in general, in general you're trying to address in the book, right? And then we can get into the nitty gritty. Right. Yes. And, and so, within that, I'm sorry, within that, I was going to ask, and who did you write this book for? Mm -hmm. David's question first, but who is this aimed at? Okay. Okay. This book is really aimed for uh, people in a primary fashion, for people with an orthodox background who probably have been exposed on the internet to some basic fundamental challenges to the most fundamental issues of our faith. Are the stories true? Was there an exodus? Why does why are there so many things that look like contradictions in the laws of the Torah? Why are there accounts in the Torah that don't line up with one another? Stories that are told in Exodus to, to, to Numbers and then repeated in Deuteronomy with wholesale differences and seeming contradictions. What do we do about all that? What do we do about the 13 principles of faith, which are universally accepted in, ortho, in the Orthodox world as the basis of our thought. And can we be at, at one and the same time intellectually honest about the, about the findings uh, uh, from, from archaeology and from philology, and, and at the same time still be faithful to the tenets of our tradition? Those are the fundamental questions that I'm aiming to, 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 to address in this book from someone with, with uh, as I say, with an Orthodox background. Now I understand. Could you write another book or an epistle which would be specifically to teachers, uh, your, your counterparts actually, uh, teachers of Bible, maybe Jewish, maybe also non-Jewish, right? With no reference whatsoever to Jewish traditions and just head on, um, as you in the critiquing source criticism, the story of the flood, you went through nine different issues in this particular one, but could you have a conversation with um, uh, Professor Dalit Ram Shiloni at Tel Aviv, who is your counterpart and say, I'd like to raise issues and problems with 
uh, the your operating system? Actually, she asks some of the questions that I do. She's not fully on board with, uh, with all of the classical source critical things. And certainly about the composition of the Torah and its lateness, she's not on board with that, I can tell you. We, we've had these discussions. She, she disagrees with Nadav Neman. She, it's very interesting. On the campus of Tel Aviv University, she and the Rosenberg School of Judaic Studies is arguing on the people of the, the archaeologists who are mm -hmm. analyzing the Bible mm -hmm. in the Gilman building within it, mm -hmm. right? But I just, uh, but I, I, I took my course, my basic course in biblical criticism uh, from her. And she, oh, really? uh -huh. you know, okay. so yeah. she'll say that, uh, you know, the classical commentators know this, this point to that point. And she told me she doesn't uh, agree with Nadav Neman, you know, Persian period, second uh -huh. temple, it, it doesn't work, etc. But the, the gestalt of yeah. This is how you analyze the text, right. and this is right. the principles and later redactions. Right. That yes, it's a dating issue. It's a yeah, yeah, but, yeah. right, right. So, so that's I, the level that I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I have plans to write such a book actually for a non-Jewish audience. I would like to do that. Um, um, I, I've had previous books that I've written. I had a previous book called uh, "Created Equal: How the Bible Broke with Ancient Political Thought," uh, which was put out by Oxford. Uh, and really, it, it, it shows how the Torah is a, a revolutionary document of political thought and really far ahead of its time and radically different than anything that existed elsewhere. That I was able to write for, for a, in a way that, that would catch everybody. Here with this particular book that we're looking at now, I felt that I had to write utilizing an in-house discourse. I wanted to write for, I'm going to use the yeshivish terms, you know, for B'nai Torah, for, for people that are observant and faithful, because I think that there's, I, I know this from my own experience, when you have even someone who has a kippah on his head and a little beard, uh, the minute you say, well, I'm a Bible professor, and I'm going to tell you how to relate to biblical criticism, already there's like, ah, ah, and so I wanted people to really feel at home with what they were reading, to feel like I am talking to them as someone who sits together with them in the Bet Midrash and in the Beit Knesset. And so the discourse throws in some Yiddish terms here and there, some Hebrew terms here and there. And of course it addresses a wide range of, of rabbinic texts in the second part of the book. Uh, but the whole first part of the book uh, easily, I am hoping at some point to condense and to put it out there for, because I think that the issues that I address there are the very same questions that all of my uh, conservative Christian colleagues who have been an enormous bulwark for me, from whom I get tremendous inspiration, and without whom I could not have written this book, uh, to write a book that would be helpful for their teachers as well. You know, just about, is this all historically true? How do you relate to that question? What do you do about, about is that what, you know, proof for the Exodus? What do you do about contradictions in law, in narrative, in the Torah? And, and that, those, those issues are exactly the same, almost word for word, what I put here, would be, I think, helpful for a, for a non-Jewish believing audience as well. But you chose to make a contribution to the Jewish conversation at this point. That's, that's why you put the you know, Magi publisher right. imprint, right? That's because right. that's who you're that's right. speaking that's to. Right. Love it. Yeah. No, I was going, just going to point out that this is on Christian minds. Uh, if mm -hmm. you listen to conservative uh, talk radio, you'll see that they're pushing uh, these... Uh, um, videos, documentaries about uh, the Exodus. I, I forget what the name of the current video is. Um, and then they have a group of people sitting and debating and discussing the issues following the presentation. And they're, they're mm -hmm. pitching this for people sitting in quarantine, you know, that mm -hmm. they should make good use of their time kind of thing. So this yeah. is on people's minds. People want to know um, a path. They want to understand a path. And I, and I think you, you do a compelling, make a compelling case. Uh, yeah. for I, I would just say for, for, for uh, our, our uh, Christian audience, if you want to find outstanding videos of the highest level of faith and of scholarship in this vein, uh, I would look for the name Sandra Richter, R-I-C-H-T-E-R. -E she's, she's a gift, a real okay. gift. Yeah. It's good to know. Okay, so can you take a particular issue now, you know, from the book, Right. Raise the questions and give us your insight. Pick one. Okay. Okay. I think one of the biggest questions for Jews and maybe even more so for Christians because of the doctrine of inerrancy uh, is that therefore, 
you know, not only is everything uh, in the Bible true, but, you know, it's, it's literally true. Uh, and I think that this gets us into hot water. And I want to take one example and lay out its complications and see what we can learn from it. Excellent. Um, if I ask, well, how many Jews, how many Jews, how many Israelites, how many descendants of Jacob went down to Egypt during that famine in Genesis 46? You know, any, any believing person or any non-believing person for that matter will say the text is 100% clear. There were 70 individuals that went down to Egypt. And that's because the Bible says the number 70. And on top of that, it gives a roll call. It gives all of those people, all of the descendants of Leah, all of the descendants of Rachel, et cetera, et cetera. So there doesn't seem to be any two ways about it, 70. But I will tell you that there weren't 70. And it's not because I'm a Bible scholar or archaeologist. This point was already made by uh, a great rabbi with a very long beard, uh, Rabbi uh, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, known in the Jewish world through the acronym Nitziv, who was perhaps the leader of the greatest yeshiva in 19th century Europe in a place called Volazhin. And he, and he didn't have any archaeological or academic training or anything. Uh, he was totally, you know, within the tradition, 1,000%. He wrote a very important uh, commentary on the Torah, and he says, it wasn't 70. And how, do, how could he say this? How could the rabbi say this? When it says 70, and it gives you the 70 names, or 69 names, and maybe Jacob is the 70th. And he says, you know, I come to this conclusion because preceding that list of 70, it says, and these are all of the descendants of Jacob who went down with him, his sons, his daughters, his grandsons, his granddaughters, and his daughters-in-law. And he says, you know, when you look at this list of the 70, you see something a little strange. There's 67 men and two women. Now, you know, we can think, wow, you know, those two girls, boy, they must have had a field day in terms of dating, you know. But, but if this includes, and this is his point, how could this possibly include all of the daughters, daughters-in-law, and granddaughters when there's only two women. So he says, it must be that it's more than 70. Okay, Rabbi, well, that might be the case, but then why does it say 70? And why does it list these people? And why does it list everybody? And I'll just add to that some other, oops, pardon me one second. Uh, that's my phone. Okay. Um, um, and he says, I'll add to, 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 to his question, if you look carefully, you will see that some of the sons of Jacob have lots of grandchildren and some have none at all. And then when you look at the order in which they are born, and then you look at the order in which they are listed in the book of Numbers or in the book of Chronicles, the orders shift. And sometimes sons become grandsons and grandsons become sons. It's a mess. It's just a mess. All right. And, and when you look at it, you know, with eyes today, scholars will say, oh, you know, clearly there's errors here and, you know, there must have been different sources because they all come to different conclusions. So what's going on here? Well, well, Rabbi Berlin, who I mentioned before, he said, well, it must be that the 70 is, is symbolic. In the book, I try to give a sense of, of the symbolism, what it is not about the 70, it is the number seven keep appearing. There's seven descendants of Rachel, or excuse me, of, of, of her handmaid and 14 of Rachel and Leah and her handmaid together are 49. So you see sevens coming out all over the time, all over the place. So there seems to be some symbolism here about seven. And of course, the totality is 70. So that really what the Bible is doing here is not giving you a genealogy or a census. What it's really doing, and this is, happens to be true about how numbers are used throughout the ancient Near East, is that these are encoded messages. Seven is a number of supreme importance and of sanctity. And what it's telling you is that the children of Israel at this stage in life, they are full of perfection in all of their units, which are seven and 14 and 49, and in their totality, which is 70. And then when you happen to look at the numbers, which are cooked, clearly they're not everyone that's mentioned. Then you see that the primary matriarchs, Rachel and Leah, have each of them twice the number of descendants as their respective handmaids. And so that's another way of encoding, wow, that the primary matriarchs, Leah and, and Rachel, are of greater significance than the secondary uh, uh, matriarchs, their handmaids. 
So what comes out of this is that what we thought with our modern eyes is that this is a census and 70 means 70. And what we discover here is that so often, so often, not just the critics, we ourselves, we as believers, fall into the trap of anachronism, fall into the trap of reading the text with our modern eyes, because it's all we have. We assume that 70 means 70, because we are accustomed to relating to numbers as fully quantitative statistical markers. But pre-modern writing, certainly ancient writing, did not always do this. And so when we look at how these numbers are being used, we can see that they are encoded markers of message. Otherwise, there's no way around it. It could not possibly have been that this entire list includes all of Jacob's daughters, daughters-in-law, and granddaughters, and there are two women on the list. And so this is a surprising revelation. It's a surprising revelation to see this type of discrepancy. And then it's even more, more surprising in a very positive and enlightening way for us to discover, wow, there's so much more going on here than we thought. We thought it was just a roll call with the tally. And what it's really about is imparting a message. And so I think that this is a really important example for all of us who have a high view of scripture. Having a high view of scripture does not mean that everything is literal at face value. You must have a sense and a sensitivity of ancient Near Eastern convention in order to read scripture properly. Otherwise, you are doomed to fall into the pit of anachronism and reading the Bible through strictly modern eyes. Let, yeah, let me try to say that back. You're saying Divra Torah, Colossian B'nai Adam, and although the Torah is... At this Bar is Barnea, question, please translate that. Translate that. Right. Uh, that, uh, that although the Torah is eternal, it's speaking the language of people, and we have lost the sensitivity of the cultural nuances uh, I was just watching a conversation between an Englishman and an American, and the Americans said, "If you, if you'll pardon me, please, uh, I'm going, I'm going to use the phrase, I'm going to step up to the plate, which is a baseball reference. So if you read that three centuries later and you don't realize that the context that every rabbi in America spoke to was to hit it out of the park or to round whatever the muscle was." that you missed it. And although we can translate, and although we have the commentary, this, what you're saying is that, uh, that's a specific example, but there are others that the nuances, the structure, the choice of topics, and there's everybody would say, oh, uh, your Mio is talking about shepherds because he's talking to a nation of shepherds. So it's not that I can't understand what he's talking about shepherds, but if you talk about a flock without a shepherd, and you never saw a flock without a shepherd, you're not really getting it. So you're saying that the nuances over here of what I mean by numbers is an example of ancient Near Eastern uh, communication, numbers mean more. And so you're not challenging that every word of Torah is true. You're saying it wasn't meant to be literal, it was encoded. Right. Am I understanding you? Let me just say a little bit more about this. I know that when I, because when I present this, I, I see the kind of pushback on people's faces. Sometimes they're very polite about it. And they'll go, but why doesn't, why doesn't the Torah just say it plain? Just say it. Why does it have to, you know, do this, you know? And, and I'm, I'm reminded of uh, the, the first girl I dated. She had a mantra. She used to say, be reasonable, do things my way. And, and uh, well, it, you know, it, it didn't work out. Uh, we, we didn't get married. Um, um, I hope she's not listening to the podcast. And, uh, but, you know, there's, there's, when we say we want the Torah to speak the way we do, then we're being like that girl. And things change from generation to generation. It is not, it, when we say that the Torah spoke in the way, this is how the Rambam, Maimonides puts it, that the Torah is written in a kind of an, with immediacy for the first generation of those that left Egypt. The Rambam says this in many places in the Mor Nebuchim. He did not feel that he was in any way denigrating the Torah by writing that. He simply understood what is just a simple truth. 
There is no kind of spiritual Esperanto that even the Almighty can speak in and write in that will be understood in all of its implications with full immediacy by all peoples in all places at all times. This is not a because of a, of a limitation on the Almighty. It's because of the limitation of we. We are all situated in a certain place and a certain time. And so we get most of what the Bible says. And then there are things that we have to fortunately take the blessing of the tools we can get from, from, from the academy to help us understand a little bit better. I think, I think one of the um, outstanding uh, examples that Barnea often gives when he's presenting is the example of place names in uh, the books of Joshua and in the books of the uh, Shoftim, the judges. Um, and that there's this, and we, we coined the term terra disconnect. And so you can have a long list of place names, which in Eastern Europe didn't mean anything. And in, in day school for me, they didn't mean anything because there was no way to connect to those places because they weren't part of our reality. You know, so if you, if you were in Manhattan, to use an example, if you know Fifth Avenue, you get the cultural context of what Fifth Avenue means. You don't have to say anything more than that. Numbers work a little differently. Um, I think in the West, the, 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 let me just, just like, finish this thought. Let me just finish yeah. this thought, right? With numbers, we, we are trained from an early age to think of numbers about as empirically as we can think about anything. So the, the, the purest form of truth is numbers. And so we want numbers to be hard and fast. And you make a very good point in the book, right? That it's possible that when we talk about 40 years or 80 years for a malchut or a, or a rulership, we're talking about a generation or a complete uh, context for that, that rule. Um, that goes against the Western sensibility about how we understand numbers. Um, and it's just too coincidental to say that so many people serve for such nice round numbers. So there, there, there needs to be another or an additional layer of understanding to what those numbers represent. That, that being said, um, I don't think we always even have the tools to be able to understand what those references are. And I think talking about an ancient Near Eastern context is helpful, but it's limited to some degree. And I think part of that lies in the fluidity with which B'nai Israel have always treated time um, astronomy, the power that is given over to the Beit Din and the Sanhedrin to play with time. Um, and so that even if you have a demon, it's not going to work out properly in terms of when we're going to declare the new moon. We'll keep them over for a little while longer so that Rosh Chodesh doesn't come at a time that creates other kinds of problems. That's not empirical. No. That is... Um, a, a, a tremendous empowerment, so to speak. And one of the numbers that I, I and again, I, I, I don't think we should talk, spend the time talking about it now, but we're kind of married to this idea of 5,780 years since creation. And even that, that number by the Balaya Kabbalah, by the, the, the masters of, of our hidden tradition was not seen as being an absolute number. Right. Arne, go ahead. I, I, I'm sorry I cut you off. I, I just I wanted an example for the audience before you went on. For example, when we say that David and Goliath fought in Emekaila, anybody who lives there sees the trucks coming in from Ashdod, from the land of the Plishtim, going into Judah and coming back and forth. And many times I've left the old city of Jerusalem, gone to Ephrat to pick you up, and we've crossed Emekaila to go out to Ben Gurion Airport, which is in the land of the Philistines. It means a crossroads. I don't have to explain it. It's obvious uh, the context, whereas those opening verses of Samuel 1, chapter 17 are often skipped in the classroom because the teacher doesn't know themselves where they are. They've told us, doesn't know themselves where they are and has to get to look at the bravery and the um, uh, belief in God of David facing Goliath in the 45 minutes minus this minus that of time for this lesson on Wednesday morning on November before the big play or whatever it is. So they don't, and so we're missing that. And then there's the aspect of <clears throat> a Beit Habad or a Gat, and very often the teacher or the learner has no idea what they are, whereas we have the home court advantage in Israel of saying, here is 
a, a, a wine press, you know, from the time of, right, and here are the different components we've actually found it. And you're in Barilan, uh, Rabbi Dr. Daniel Sperber has printed books of here's this item and here is the real thing. That's realia. What you, with numbers, you're touching on a deeper thing. So uh, what David was referring to 40 and 80, so you'll find the Abarbanel saying it can't be two and a half years, it can't be 40. Or you'll find the Mephorshim saying it's over um, uh, lapping years. So within the confines of the traditional Bet Midrash, there are discussions that this number mean that or not. This element of um, that it's representative with echoes in the ancient Near East is not universally accepted. But on the other hand, this is, I'm voicing a personal opinion, but on the other hand, it hasn't been um, raised enough for the peer review of the Bet Midrash to even have a discussion and one of the things which you did hear, which I don't recall seeing a print in a Jewish book before, is you, pardon me, enumerated um, various examples. You laid them out for consideration. What do you think about this? Now, the, the person sitting in the Beit Medrash can say, wait a minute, and start going to Svarim and come out with different aspects. But you gave a consistent view. So you put it on the table for discussion. I thought that was very valuable. So, uh, just to get us back into into the book uh, a, a little bit, um, there is a certain um, focus that you've decided to address the the issues that you've selected, right, to present as being challenging. Were those personal issues, or were those the ones that you felt were the most uh, of interest and help and benefit to to the targeted audience? A little bit of both. Um, almost all the answers that I give in the book are from my own research. Um, um, sometimes calling from others, but uh, largely questions that bothered me and I went and researched and, uh, you know, everything that's in the book has been published in, ac in, in, in academic uh, publication forums beforehand. Um, in top journals or in Oxford University Press. Um, and I guess I was drawn to these questions because these are the big questions, you know, that I mentioned before. How do you deal with historical accuracy? How do you deal with the exodus? How do you deal with, with uh, uh, contradictions? Yeah, you and deal I with guess, the flood also. So let's have some fun. Uh, so I'm going to say, as a student in Tel Aviv University uh, and as an archaeologist, that currently there's no archaeological proof of the exodus from Egypt. You don't expect a king to put up a stella saying, and boy, did we lose big, and then this happened, and that, oh, it was terrible, I was, oh, yeah, 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 you don't expect that. And in contrast to that, as David Ben-Gurion said in front of a commission, I think in 47, uh, you Americans don't know um, when your ancestors came over the dates, the, the Pinta, the Maria, the Santa, but every Jew throughout the world, if you ask them, when do we come a nation, will answer the 15th of Nisan. And there's a strength to, in, in, in using anthropological rules, using sociological rules, there's a strength to when all 22 tribes of the, this region say, we were founded by Chief Hoham, you knew that there was once a Chief Hoham. I love Hoham because he was the king of Hebron, I like to say the most exciting man in Tanakh, Melech Hoham. Yeah, oh. so, so um, there's a discussion called the High Court of Archaeology. Nadav Neman wrote about it. Heard, right? To what degree is the archaeological proof's existence or not existence a determinant of whether something happened or not? So before reading your book, I would simply argue that the, uh, the fact that there are millions of people spread throughout the world who for thousands of years are having the story, and it's, it's corroborating, and a work that has not been done really accurately. I just picked up this safer today of Ruben Regal, Samikra, and Basura, but in the academic world, it has not been sufficiently discussed. The um, comparisons of Torah scrolls throughout and the different traditions which you find in the Talmud and the commentaries just recently, Masech Shabbat, about numbering every single letter. You can't create that. You can't create a whole body of knowledge and a... Uh, uh, and a Shulchan Arach discussing in detail what happened if you missed the letter and the letter scroll. 
you can't create that whole culture that's that Yemeni Jews know if you were just coming towards the end of the second temple and creating it. So there's other factors. You just demurred, and you want to argue that there is an archaeological basis for the exodus of Egypt, correct? Yeah, I would say more epigraphic than archaeological, and I can explain what I mean. Okay, yeah. okay. We're all ears. Right, okay. So I think that normally the way that the question of the historical accuracy of the exodus is framed is as follows. Well, we're going to look around everywhere we can in Egypt, all the archaeological sites, we're going to read all the inscriptions, and we're going to look for some sign of this thing we call the Exodus. And you know what? When we do that, we don't find a whole heck of a lot. That's the truth. That's just the plain truth, boys and girls. And uh, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. But it's not the right question to ask. It's not the right question to ask because uh, the passage of time means that lots gets broken down and cleared away. It's not the right question to ask because the whole area of Goshen, where the Israelites were, is now submerged underwater in the, in the, in the, in the Delta Nile. Um, it's not the right question to ask because, you know, there's so much papyrus that we don't have and so many monumental uh, uh, inscriptions that we don't have. But that's not even the main point. The main point is that it's not the right question to ask. There's a different question to ask. Not the question of do we find evidence of Exodus in Egypt? Do we find evidence of Egypt in Exodus, in the Bible? And what I mean by that is this. If we can see that there are very exquisite type references, allusions, appropriations of Egyptian inscriptions, inside the Bible, then we can begin to talk. And there are tons of them, little ones, all over the place. One of my favorite nuggets is this. Uh, consider the, the well-known phrase, God took us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Biyad chazakal v'zroa netuyam. Now, now that, there's something interesting about that phrase. Uh, you might expect that the Bible Anytime that God does some great act of salvation, you might expect the Bible to say, there goes the Almighty again with his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. But the truth is, is that it's a very rare phrase, and it is only used with reference primarily to the exodus from Egypt. Here's why. Because in that period, what we call the, uh, uh, the New Kingdom uh, in Egypt, it was de rigueur for the pharaohs to write in inscriptions about their great deeds. And everything they did <clears throat> was considered to be a function of their mighty hand and outstretched arm. And then the iconography also, it's Pharaoh smiting, going way back, even before yeah, Egypt. Yeah, yeah, I bring pictures. Older things also, but the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this phrase that, oh, the great Pharaoh, he, he bagged a hundred elephants with his mighty hand, and he uh, sacked the Libyans with his outstretched arm, and he built this, uh, this great city with mighty hand and outstretched arm. It's all over the place in that period. The tradition happens to say is the period of the, uh, the slavery in, in, in Egypt. Now, why is the Torah using a phrase like mighty hand and outstretched arm if it's from the Egyptians to describe what God is doing? And what we have here is a wonderful example of what we call cultural appropriation. Cultural appropriation is where you take your oppressor's propaganda and you steal it from them. And the best example that I know of this happened here in Israel six years ago during uh, Tsuketan, during uh, Protective Edge. That, that was our last skirmish with, uh, with, with Hamas in, 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 in Gaza. Gaza the, Hamas in Gaza put out a, a, um, uh, a propaganda video in Hebrew. They made it in Hebrew with a very, you know, Arab jingo type of thing. And in that video, it had, you know, Hamas terrorists popping out of their tunnels and spraying bullets everywhere. And the idea was to demoralize the Israeli home front with this song in Hebrew. It was in Hebrew uh, called Kum Ase Biguim, uh, Get Up and Make Attacks. And do you know what Israelis did with that? They began to take the song and put up spoofs of it on YouTube. Some versions were reggae, some versions of the song were classical, some were jazz. What Israelis were, I was at a wedding, at a wedding. They brought out bride and groom, and the band struck up, Koma Se Piguim, rise and make attacks. 
this was our way of fighting back culturally, cultural appropriation. You steal their thunder and you use it against them. And that's what the Torah is doing by saying that God took, God took Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. It's out pharaohing the pharaoh. It's using their own cultural symbols against them. Okay? And there's a lot of examples of this. Uh, I bring them in the book. But what really takes the show here, takes the cake, is that the entire story of the Exodus, the actual coming out, chapters 14 and 15 of Exodus, including the Song of Moses, excuse me, the Song of the Sea, uh, it turns out follows very closely with many, many, many similar uh, uh, terms, the most significant inscription of the 13th century BCE, which was uh, the account by Ramses the Great of his victory over the Hittites at a place called Kadesh. Not Kadesh that's in the Tanakh, a Kadesh that's up uh, on the Syrian-Lebanese border. And this, what's called the Kadesh inscriptions, this was plastered all over Egypt. There are more copies of this composition than any other victory composition anywhere in the ancient world, including Greece and Rome. This was the most publicized victory in all of ancient, the entire ancient world. And this was kind of used as an indoctrinator. And there are eight copies in Egypt, I think, extent. Ten. 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 Extent. Ten. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, and not only on monuments, they found papyrus copies of this inside the camps of workmen, slaves, not necessarily Jewish ones, okay? But, but this just shows you, this was the little red book. Ramses is great, his God is great, his army is great. And so anybody living at that time knew about this. And when you see that the story so closely hews to that text, this is not evidence of the Exodus in Egyptian sources. This is evidence of Egypt in Exodus, in the Bible itself. And then you have to ask, how did it get there? When did it get there? We can talk more about that, but I, all of that leads me to the conclusion, uh, uh, for reasons that I lay out there, it had to be in that century, and it had to be by people that were there. And so then you have to say, they must have had something going on, something. So Az Yashir Moshe of Israel, which in the eyes of Chazal, in the simple verse, but in the eyes of Chazal, are talking about current and future events and, and describe in detail what exactly happened to the, uh, uh, to the Egyptians and hints towards future Geula. They're saying that the cultural absorption of that, it's naturally, that's what I'm, I'm going to, uh, it's going to be a guideline to express the turnaround of the Nahafaku, so to speak, is going to be expressed in those terms because this is the height of how to put things. Right, there's, yes. there's the model yes. and I... Yes, except that, that there's nothing that I said, Barnea, that requires us to uh, 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 delegitimate or devalue the actual event itself. You know, for, you know there's, there's various takes. Was there, was the splitting of the sea, you know, exactly as it says? Was there some type of natural element to it? I don't have a stake in that question, but I definitely accept that there's an exodus and there's something enormous that happened and maybe even exactly word for word as what the Bible says. But what is significant for me is that the Bible chooses and it's always choosing selectively. It is choosing things that hew so closely to this other inscription that the, 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 the implication for anyone who reads the story is, oh, I get it. We are undoing the greatest accomplishment of the greatest Pharaoh of the greatest kingdom of Egypt the Kaddish battle, the, the victory of Kaddish by Ramses II. That's your application of the Rambam's principle in the Mora, that I'm speaking contemporary. I might be speaking for all times, but it's phrased in that contemporary sense. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know in Zoom it's a distraction if you move, but I, w I think you're attacking a certain book, which I think I know where it is in my shelf. So I'm going to stand up for a second, pardon me. That's it. Yeah. You know, Not bad. Barnea, very Hitchcocky in uh, camera angles there. Thank <laughs> you for sharing that. Egypt, oh, wow. Egypt's role in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Bible. Thomas Roman Shirley Bendor Evian, she is the Egyptologist at the Israel Museum. Thomas Romer is your um, uh, 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 counterpart at, um, at the Sorbonne or the College no, de no, France. No, no. 
think he's in college. Switzerland. No? Yeah, the College de France. He, he's involved. He often comes to Tel Aviv University, and he's a co-director of the excavation at Kirat Yarim, together with Israel Finkelstein and others. So um, the, the point of this journal, which cost me $40 at ASOR in San Diego just now, is um, that the trend used to be that people said, okay, the Bible text was uh, undoubtedly a product of the Iron Age, and therefore the Egyptian old, middle, new kingdoms were comparison. They're saying the new questions ask, not what is Egyptian in the Bible, but rather how did Egyptian traditions find their way into the biblical text? And at what point? So look at the interrelations between Egypt and Israel in the 11th, late 10th, early 9th, and late 8th centuries as evidenced by the dispersion of Egyptian finds, attesting to direct Egyptian influences even before the 7th century BCE. Uh, the approach, Redford's treatment marks a true departure because he's saying, ah, if, it's, if the Bible is written later, then what did they know about Egypt. Don't think of this being, it's, I think it's directly challenging your premise right now, right? Don't think of it, oh, that's from that time, and therefore they have to be parallel. It's later, and the question is how they know it. So Egyptian inspirations in the Book of Psalms, one of four Proverbs, and the Song of Songs, demonstrating a biblical familiarity with Egyptian wisdom literature. Although how and when these influences were imprinted remained Debatable. So now they discuss four, I'll just say one more point, four archaeological phases of interaction between Egypt and Philistia, Israel, and Judah during the Iron Age, the influence of Egyptian elements in Philistia and Carmel Coast in the 11th century. We see Egyptian pottery in Beersheba and Negev and Shvela in the mid 10th, mid 9th centuries. We see maybe with Shoshan. We see the reappearance of Egyptian pottery in the 8th century BCE in Judah and the use of Egyptian cultic finds of Ashtod, Ekron, Ashkel, Meitzach, Asher, late 7th and 6th centuries. And now let's talk about, since the Bible was written, in their view, that much later, that's why they have this, how did they know? It changes, it's an upheaval of everything. You are counteracting and saying that, the fact that it's um, era-specific, epic specific that this phraseology is only used here and we have the archaeological dating that that is when that document was that shows that this song is meant to match and it's not something that a later writer would come up and be so an egyptologist one second for that period i have to write like this and for this period there was no baseball yet so we'll find something else so you you, you are responding to this I believe. Well, I wasn't aware of that specifically, but that trend in the scholarship. Look, the Kaddish, the Kaddish poem that I, that I alluded to before, uh, as I mentioned, was, was incredibly widely disseminated in the 13th century. There is no mention of it afterwards anywhere in Egypt. There is no reuse of it. There is no copying of it. There's no mimicking of it. No one knew about it afterwards. And so it is, and for that, for that matter, there has never been any Egyptian inscription of any length, any composition of any length that has been found outside the borders of the land of Egypt. So to say that there's some Israelite caveman in his cave in the seventh century or the sixth century, and he somehow got hold of the Kaddish poem of Ramses II, uh-uh. Didn't have access to Google. Didn't yeah. have access to Google, okay? And I'll say that the presentation, I mean, I, mean, I haven't seen that book, Barnea, but that's a very selective uh, examination of the evidence. There, is a, there are a lot of things, especially in the tabernacle chapters of the book of Exodus, which have very striking uh, affinity uh, in terms of language, in terms of iconography, with things that are happening only in the new kingdom of Egypt, which is late bronze and prior to the Iron Age. That doesn't guarantee anything, but, but it, uh, it all adds up at some point. You got to say that somehow this is the point of entry. That doesn't necessarily prove that the text that we have was written then. But the point of entry, it seems to me, for a lot of this material, starts back then, earlier than what Romer says. 
So we've been going for almost an hour, and I told you that was uh, our usual uh, cutoff. Um, I would certainly love to invite you back uh, to do another session another mm -hmm. time. Um, where can people get a hold of your book? Okay, so uh, Anima Amin, Biblical Criticism, Historical Truth, and the 13 Principles of Faith is uh, put out by Corin Publishers, and uh, they have a website that will service you uh, here in Israel and in America. It's on Amazon, and it's in Jewish bookstores everywhere. That's where you can get it. Terrific. Barnett? You gave a, a, a fascinating introduction that, and the completion of a book, and you brought the sources of, do you make a Shechianu, because it's a new book, or do you make a Baruch Dain Emes, since inevitably the Kleisenberg Rebbe has to have the mistakes, so you made both, um, you made both blessings. And you've introduced this conversation by saying, that this was a path to write to uh, the Orthodox from the inside, introduce them to their ideas, give them some things to bolster them, give them some to work on. And also, especially in the second part of the book, which we really didn't touch, clarification of what the principles of Rambam is. I just want to warn the listeners, um, this took me um, three days of work, interrupted by having to have a Shabbos meal and other things, but this was a, a concentrated, flow. You read this in one go, right? It's it, developmental and it's building and it involves your mind. You, this is not the famous story of the Abarbanel, this person who told his son, don't learn the Abarbanel. He says, why that? He says, because I would read it Friday night. I only got through the questions. I fell asleep. I became a heretic. Kind of it, right? So you wrote it for this principle. Can you give us a, a closing words of the Untashtashura, which you addressed in your afterword here, what should we walk away with feeling after reading the book? What is your prime message? The prime message is that uh, a lot of the questions that are thrown out uh, uh, that seem challenging are rooted in modern and anachronistic uh, views, attitudes, and perceptions that we have. And that the more that we are able to get in touch with uh, the original time and the ancient context of the Torah, the more that a lot of these questions fall away. And I would say also that, that uh, in terms of the second half of the book, that the, the theological tenets that we hold dear, uh, we hold dear. There's no, getting, there's no getting around those. And there's no, no trying to excuse ourselves from those. However, the, the question of, what does it mean that we have accepted the 13 principles of faith has a history and it's, it's been in a constant state of flux and it's not, it's a history that is not well known. I'm talking about the rabbinic history, how, how the great luminaries of, of the Jewish world, uh, the Chafetz Chaim, uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein have taken different views of these things and applied them in different ways. And it behooves us to understand what does it mean that we have accepted? How has that been defined? Because it's changed over time. What text, of the 13 principles of faith have we accepted? There are actually many and, and different ones and they say somewhat different things. Why is that? What are we supposed to do with that? That's all part two of the book. So that my, my, the, the big takeaway is that I think a lot of believing Jews live in a tremendous state of fear that they either have to be uh, align themselves with the tradition, with everything they've been told, exactly the way they've been told from a very young age, often without nuance or sophistication. And if they don't stick with that, then it's all Wellhausen and it's all that the Torah is one long account of fake news and there's nothing in between. And I think that it is possible for us to come to ways of looking at all these questions that are fully endowed with spiritual and intellectual integrity. That's a terrific note to end our session as we go into the holiday of Shavuot. I want to thank <laughs> Rabbi <laughs> Doctor. Uh, Yoshua Berman for spending the time with us. And uh, as we said, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do a part two. On Amen. behalf of uh, the uh, Landmines podcast, this is David Wilner. And Barney Levy Sullivan. Wishing okay. you all a Chag Sameach. Have a wonderful holiday and a Shabbat Shalom. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. And thank you, audience. And a Chag Sameach to everybody.